Yeah, my mic was muted. Classic beginning. Okay, everyone, let me make this full screen and then we can get started. Where's my mouse? Oh, this is starting great. There it is. Perfect. Okay, cool. I was searching for kind of like a whiteboarding uh, example, whiteboarding image on the internet, and this came up. And it's like, it's been for so long that I've been in a room together and really just like jammed with other people. It's kind of like, like, like building on top of things. Uh, it's been a long time during the pandemic. But also what we've seen during the pandemic is, is something like this. This is uh, TikTok sea shanties where people are kind of like where one person started singing a tune and other people just like piled on top of this and piled on top of this. And it's amazing collaborative art piece, a collaborative music piece. If you haven't seen this, like just Google sea shanties TikTok and you'll find a couple of amazing examples. But also same as with uh, Dylan in his keynote, I'm, I'm referencing jazz because I, A, I'd love to go to a concert again and B, just seeing people build or kind of like build on top of and just play music together, which is also a form of kind of like building on top of each other's ideas uh, would, would just be amazing. And I think all of these, all of these are examples of collaborative creativity. We're gonna dive into this a little bit. And to get a couple of things out of the way, collaborative creativity is, is mainly a theory about how we build on top of each other's ideas. And it's in its core, it's a way about how we innovate together, really. And I hope my goal for this talk is that this will inspire you to work towards more open and inclusive ways of working because you will believe, or I hope at least, that this makes sense. And so ultimately, this kind of like feels, once this is happening, once you can like leverage the, the collective collaborative creativity, uh, it feels like you're transitioning away from a my ideas mindset to an our ideas mindset. And we're gonna dive into this a little bit by going through the different building blocks of collaborative creativity. The core, the first one is by association. It's kind of like a where do ideas come from, what's happening in our brains at this point in time. The second one is gonna talk about the magic of creating things, and why externalizing things is so important for us. Uh, the third one is ultimately about the magic of shared creation environments in which like this transition from my ideas to our ideas is happening. And then the fourth one is why we need to, to fail together ultimately. And so let's start with the first one. And I bet a lot of you don't know this. I didn't know this either, but this is uh, poly, the chemical formula of polytetrafluoroethylene. And um, yes, I had to Google this and I had to like try out the pronunciation a couple of times. Um, but this is ultimately kind of like the chemical formula for, for the compounds like known, known as Teflon. And it's been fascinating to me because I didn't know that like Teflon before it was on pans like not used for that, used for a bunch of different things. So the story is in 1954 in France, where Colette Grégoire, the, the wife of an engineer who is using Teflon in his day-to-day -day life to, to cover fishing rods and help them kind of like be, be faster and, and not call up that much. And, and she had this idea, let's, let's like use this material that you're using and let's put this on pans. And that's essentially how, how nonstick pans were born. And I think it's an amazing innovation and it's fascinating to understand to think about kind of like how this happens. So there were existing struggles with pans, right? And there was an understanding of Teflon. Colette had an understanding of Teflon. And because she had both of those frames of thoughts in her mind, she came up with this idea, let's make nonstick pans. And this process is called by the process of bisociation. It's described by the Hungarian author, Arthur Köstler. And it ultimately just says that like, that bisociation is a, is a new thing that you create through the connection of two previously unrelated pieces of thoughts in your mind. And I think this is, this is fascinating because if we, if we summarize this, I don't think where do ideas come from perfectly fits, but how do we have novel ideas? And a diverse set of knowledge makes finding innovative ideas more likely because the more different frames of thoughts you have in your mind, the, the, the more likely you can, you are able to create connections between those two. And I think that's fascinating. And so the next three sections are about like, how do we get these diverse set of thoughts in our mind? And so the first one is the magic of, of creating things. And maybe you've heard about rubber duck debugging, which also sometimes feels like a, like a tongue, tongue twister, rubber duck debugging. Um, but it's ultimately the idea that like, if you're working on code and uh, or if you're working on code, you kind of like put a rubber duck next to you and you go through, if you're running into a bug, you go through every single line and you explain this to, to the rubber duck. And by externalizing it, you think differently about the things that you've created. 
And the same thing is happening in, in industrial design. Here's Ken Kusiena, one of the designers who worked on, on the iPhone, showing kind of like iPhone prototypes that they've used. And in this picture uh, from, from my roommate, Olivier, kind of like it's very clear how in industrial design you need multiple iterations that are costly to create and put side by side. And at this point, I kind of like want to sing an ode to, to, to the digital medium because I just, just think it's wonderful because what you can do is command D, command D, command D, and then hit command zero. And that's a, that's a fascinating flow because duplicating something is, is essentially for free. And all of this allows you to express your ideas really quickly and, and explore different kinds of ideas and put them next to each other and then experience them really quickly. And I think that that's a, that's a beautiful, beautiful notion of, of the digital medium. And so you've seen files like this, yeah, where there's just like a ton of frames, a ton of different iterations. And here's an example where I've been like trying out, this talk is gonna be a little bit meta about the talk itself too. Um, we have kind of like tried out different ways of finding like this model for these building blocks. And here's like the first outline of this talk. There's another outline of this talk. You things blend together, things are put side by side. And here's like where I landed a couple of days ago and we're actually here right now. And so we'll go through the rest in a bit. And if you look at this theory, so we have this mind, right? That's that's like what's happening in our brain where this process of dissociation is subconsciously happening all the time. And the moment we create something, the moment we take basically all of our knowledge of an idea and we create an object, that moment is, is fascinating because that in that moment you can take a step back and you can evaluate. So by externalizing all of your knowledge into an object that's somewhere maybe in the digital environment, maybe in the physical environment, you can learn back from this. And, and this is just absolutely fascinating. It's what's described as a dialogue between the mind and the sketch in sketching user experiences from uh, Bill Buxton, a designer and researcher at Microsoft. And it's, it's so fascinating to me. Of course, this is kind of just learning by doing, right? But, but what this is actually happening is that we can gain new knowledge just through creating things. And this is just, I don't know, I love this. I love this. And it's, it's, it, it makes me happy to work on creative tools in which people can can do these things. And um, let's jump into the next one, which is the magic of shared spaces. And, and I think where this my ideas to our ideas transition is really happening. So let's look back at these examples. And here on the left, we, we ultimately see kind of like someone posted basically the original thing and other people piled on top of that. They, they took this thing, they, they duplicated it and they created a new thing. Other people took that, created a new thing. So you can like see the transition here going up like, I think maybe this one was the original. I, it's hard to tell, it's hard to tell. And so what happens here is that each individual remixes the previous work and builds on top. And in the context of remixes, there is this amazing video series, Everything is a Remix from Kirby Ferguson. And it ultimately talks that in like video and in music, all of the things that we are doing are combinations or, or come from somewhere. Else. And he shows amazing examples, like in one of my favorite movies, Star Wars, there, there are scene by scene comparison where it's basically like, hey, you just like took this from there. And there's another example where it's like, this is nearly the same shot. And you just kind of like combine them differently. And this, the amazing thing that, that he describes here is that there's a couple of basic elements of creativity where there's, you can copy something, you can transform something and you can combine them. And I think all of these are happening when we work together and build on top of each other's ideas. But the thing that I want to dive into is, is, is both of these examples on the right. Because what both of these have in common is that all of the people in them have equal access to create in their shared space. And I think that that's the magical thing that's happening. And let me tell you a story from 2018 when I was in San Francisco. I kind of like joined Figma because I was excited about uh, the component override system that they had at the time, which was kind of like more complex. Uh, and the question was kind of like, Nico, can you, can you redesign the common pins? And I was like, Sure, let's, let's give it a try. I'm a designer, I can do this. And so I wireframed a couple of common pins out, a couple of different states of where they could be, and I brought them into DesignCrit. And at this point, I hadn't really used Figma when I started, and uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't really used Figma before I started, and, and I wasn't sure about this like collaborative, collaborative environment. And what happened was that we put on some tunes, and in those 15 minutes during this crit session, people like just took my, took my things and like, tried out some ideas, other people took those ideas and, and explored them. I tried out to kind of like see what's happening overall. And when I left the script, those weren't my ideas anymore. Those were our ideas suddenly. And the, the role of me as a designer was not to be like, hey, I had this amazing idea. 
but you couldn't trace back who had this idea because everyone kind of like cross inspired everyone else. And I think that that was a magical moment for me because it was the first time where I really experienced this in a digital environment and not in a whiteboard. And so if we look at this, as a, at this example where we have the personal iteration process here on the right, the moment someone comes in into a shared space, which, which can be a digital space as well, the moment they can learn from that, they can learn from this object that is in the middle. And they can, like, if you look at this, like the, the association process for that person has now kicked off, right? And of course, it would be ideal, and, and, and with voice, for example, people can communicate with each other. But the fascinating aspect, the thing that is so impactful is this step here, that when a collaborator can create in the same space that you create, magical things happen. Because of course, there's this personal iteration process here that kind of originated now from the object, but you're manipulating it and like, while you're editing, you realize something and you like try something other thing out. But this, this flow is the fascinating thing that because the moment you create something, other people can learn from the thing that you create and create new things, which allows you, and it goes on and, and on and on and on and on. And it's just like a magical feeling when we kind of like collaboratively iterate on things. And I think this is more, this is ultimately maybe the loop of collaborative creativity and of, of, of solving problems together. And so if we think about what is the magic of shared creation spaces, it's ultimately that the more we create next to each other, the better we can learn from each other. Because it's more than just learning by, by seeing, by kind of like leaving someone, leaving feedback and, and kind of like seeing what, what, what other people are saying, but actually seeing them create in the same space that you create. I don't know, that's just, that just feels magical to me. And we're working on this at Figma. We're trying hard to kind of like, like achieve this. And there's two highlights from, from Dylan's keynote today that I want to share. And the first one is in all of this, I'm talking about kind of like life scenarios, right? And those are great if you, if you need to explore a ton of ideas and if you need to find the right ideas. And maybe you work with a trusted group of people, right? But in some scenarios, you might work with the contribution you want to allow every designer in your organization to contribute to your design system. And so I think that branching and merging is a huge step for us to, to enable collaborative iteration processes for different makeups of people, if that makes sense, right? For people where, where they might work very far away from each other and there's like huge groups of people who want to contribute to the same thing. You need more structured ways to be able to effectively collaborate. And then of course, FigJam. FigJam has been exciting for me to work in, in the last months. So this is the outline of my talk that I've just created with a couple of stickies uh, and a couple of connectors in between them. But also, FigJam is really challenging the notion of what a digital space is and how fun it can be. Uh, there are many more greater examples on the website, and you should definitely check that out. And like voice and, and mobile all fit into this fit into the story of changing how digital spaces can feel like for us. And this is just the beginning. Of course, this isn't this is a fancy thing to say, but like I'm so excited about the things that we're already working on and the things that are coming next. And Let's jump into this last section, which is why do we need to fail together? Because ultimately to acknowledge creativity is an intimate process, right? It's like you have an idea, it might be small, it might like not be sure how, how to share it somewhere. Um, but and, and, and even more importantly, iterating with others is scary because kind of like by definition, you put something out there that isn't yet finished, right? You put something out there, others leave feedback. And, and you improve it. And, and that moment you realize, oh shit, the thing that I shared originally isn't that good as the thing that I have now. And so you need to be comfortable with this. And a couple of days ago, I saw this, uh, this graphic from, from the Twitter account Liz and Molly. And it was like, ideas people share when they do not feel belonging. And ideas people share when they do. And I think this is, this is, this is hugely important because if we think back about this process of by association, right? then the more diverse ideas we have, the more likely innovation is. And so we need to create a high trust culture. We need to create a culture of yes and to quote Tina Fey and her rules of improv, right? And I think that you can summarize this as a culture of failing together. And this is something that I've talked with Kelsey, my colleague uh, at, at Figma on at, Europe con at Config Europe, sorry, that way around. Uh, at Config Europe last, last year, where we talked about the process of how we designed and tested variants. And it was important because when, when people can fail together, when failing is normalized, then, then bold ideas are, are allowed to be contributed and they are the start of change. They are, their bold ideas are the start of change 
and innovation. And so a couple of things that we did that might be super tactical at first was creating a design work in progress channel. So we had a design crit channel, but changing this context towards, hey, you can like just share whatever you, you feel like in here is 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 really was really a difference in kind of like the context setting of our behaviors in Slack. And encouraging others to riff is a pattern that 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 we've also seen emerging, which is like, hey, here's the link to my to my Figma file. Here you can see kind of like uh, Jenny needing needing feedback on a couple of icons, and here's the link if you want to riff. Or on the right, there's uh, Joel with uh, a riff zone. Joel had added a riff zone in his in his like like design crit file where people just kind of like explored a couple of ideas, and it's fascinating to see. Um, clarify what kind of feedback, and and because maybe sometimes you don't want feedback. Maybe you're like, hey, I'm good. I'm just sharing this in case anyone likes it. Uh, but I don't need feedback right now. I'm like deep in some explorations. Um, and the thing that, that was fascinating for us to realize is how the pandemic pushed us towards doing digital user testing versus in-person user testing, and how much that allowed us to involve others. So a lot of our engineers were sitting into the user testing sessions we did for variants and interactive components. And it was amazing for them to see as well how we, how we kind of like changed and, and iterated on the designs from people being like, oh, I don't get this. This is confusing. Let me start over to like, oh, I really love this. Can I have this yesterday? And so all of this, I think, are ways to kind of like create a culture of failing together. But one of the key things is, is, is ultimately is about admitting failure, especially when you're in a position of power. And so I know, again, it's again 2018 San Francisco. Um, but there's another story that I'd love to share, which is the story from, from, from Sho and me. Sho is the director of product at, at Figma, and it's been an amazing uh, partner to work with. But he has decades of experience. We always had this joke of like when he started on creative tools, I was three, just to kind of like put this in context. And I was like, like just out of school or like not even a year out of school. And we were jamming a day on like how we could solve like open overlays problem. I, yeah, it was like around three years ago when we introduced overlays and we were like unsure how to do it. And and after this jam session, we left uh, We left, and, and we were kind of like, okay, let's agree to disagree for now. And the next day I was drinking a coffee in our kitchen uh, and Sho came to me and said, and said something. I was like, Nico, Nico, I gotta tell you, something happened. I was like, you were right. But th that's not the important part. But he, has, he said after that, he said, I was wrong. And of course, you could imagine I could go out of this meeting and be like, oh, I'm always gonna be right. But that's not the takeaway here. The takeaway was that this person with decades more experience than I am, acknowledged that to, to, to me that, that he was wrong. And the feeling that I get out of that, the feeling that I still have today is that because he admitted his failure to me, it allows me to be wrong so many more times. And that's an awesome feeling because that allows me to share bold ideas, crazy ideas, wild ideas, and just put them out there and see how they go. And if they don't go well, it's like, oh yeah, I was wrong, let's, let's, let's do this other thing. But it was worth a shot. Maybe it inspired someone else to do something else. And so I think if we think about why do we need to fail together, it's ultimately that, that in a culture of failing together, bold ideas do not only kind of like come up, right? They, they are not like people don't feel comfortable, not, not only do they feel comfortable sharing bold ideas, but bold ideas can be nurtured and iterated upon and improved over time until they lead to new and innovative solutions. And so if we recap all of these building blocks of collaborative creativity, we have at the core by association that happens if, if you have a diverse set of knowledge in your head, right? That leads to more innovative ideas. And if you iterate often, you can gain new knowledge just through creating things, just through putting things out there and comparing them and putting them side by side. And if you do this in a space with others, where others can see what you're creating, can immediately respond to that or asynchronously respond to that. And, and built on top of that, you kind of like exponentially improve things that you're working on together. And if all of this happens in a culture of failing together, bold ideas can, can grow and be nurtured and, and, and really kind of like flourish to, 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 to true innovation. Because I think that that's the point that I'd love for you to take away, is that innovation is supported through collaborative creativity, right? And, and collaborative creativity works best in an open and inclusive work environment, because at the core, it's about iterating on this idea, which works best if people feel comfortable sharing their ideas. And so I hope, coming back to the beginning, I hope that this will inspire you to work towards more open and inclusive ways of working. And 
let's share our work earlier. Let's invite everyone to riff. You might never know what comes out of this. You might never know where someone sends something that, that kicks off a spark to you. And so thank you. At this point, thank you not because the talk is over, but thank you to Martin, to Jenny, to Aliyah, to Olivier, to Miguel, to Anna, to Miguel, to Jamie, to Kelsey, to Oscar, and to Kristen. All of these helped shape this talk so much. I just, just two days ago, I had a long conversation with Martin and, and last week on Thursday as well. Uh, and with Miguel and with Jamie, we kind of like refined, um, we've, we refined, we found this idea of, of building blocks and it was like a back and forth between me and Miguel and then, and then me and Jamie refined this a little bit later. So, so in the spirit of my ideas to our ideas, I'd love for this talk to not be seen as my talk, but our talk, because so many people helped in shaping this. And there's, there's one more thing that I'd love to kind of like, like look out, right? And it's, it's that all of these examples that create, that all of these examples are, are, might kind of like be related to creativity as making things look nice, but, but creativity at the core is problem solving. It's how we as humans find innovative, innovative solutions for the problems ahead of us. And so computers, I believe that computers are amazing at supporting this. They might not be the, the, the tools that solve these problems for you, but they, they help us in doing this. And this is, this is not a new thing, right? Um, that, yeah, that there's so much more potential ahead of us in, in allowing computers to support us is not a new thing. If, if we're able to do this, there, there's this quote from Douglas Engelbert that, that that payoff of what happens if we support uh, problem solving better will come when we make better use of computers to bring communities of people together and to augment the very human skills that people bring to bear on difficult problems. And so he basically describes that like, we can use computers better to help us solve the problems that we have. And this was in 1992. And it's fascinating to me. That's like nearly 30 years ago, right? And so it's fascinating me to, to, to look even further back and see that in the mother of all demos, also from Douglas Engelbart, you see two multiplayer crystals. When I, I, I didn't believe this. There's one here, there's one here. You might see them, might not be super perfect, but multiplayer existed in the mother of all demos, which is mind blowing to me. This is in 1968, that's, that's over 60 years ago. And so it's fascinating to me to look at this as a pivot point because at the beginning, we had this era of room-sized computers, right? And then over time, we moved towards, and through things, through work from Douglas Engelbart too, we moved towards an era of personal computing where computers suddenly became thought partners with, which allowed us to immediately kind of like go back and forth and expressing something and learning from it, right? But, and then it continued, I did think it continued with the smartphone being like, personal computer that is closer to you. But the, the, the aspects that brought us here, the, the paradigms, the software paradigms in particular, with tools like Google Docs, like Notion, like Coda, like Figma, um, there are so many tools out there who really start to challenge the notion of what, what, what files are, what, what personal tools, what personal creative tools are. And they're pushing those towards kind of like an era, I believe, towards an era of collaborative computing. And I'm very excited to be part of this. And I don't know where this will go. I don't know what the operating system for the era of collaborative computing will look like, but I'm very excited for us all to, to try to figure it out together. So thank you very much. And back to you, Ana and Miguel.